started. <laughs> Baruch HaMaboyim, thank you very much for coming um, to, again, the class on my thoughts and then a uh, weekly portion class behind it. Uh, again, um, I'd like to welcome you, uh, welcome you all to our home. Baruch HaMaboyim, the class tonight on my thoughts will be on blessing children. You know, with the, pande with the pandemic, a lot of attention has been focused on children. Uh, we worry about our their present situation, but we also look forward to their future, and we pray that they will be blessed by God Almighty. There is a custom among Jews, especially among Ashkenazi Jewry, to bless their children every Friday night at the uh, Shabbat table. Now, others have the tradition to bless their children on the eve of Yom Kippur, which is again the holiest day of the year. Now, the blessing that we give to our daughters is Yisimech Elokim Kesara Rivka Rachel and Leah. May God bless you that you should be like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. These four women are the mothers of the Jewish nation, our role models. They represent the best of all the traits that we should try to emulate and admire in Jewish women. It would only be logical to think that we would bless our sons with a similar blessing, that they should be like the forefathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, but Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But this is not the case. Well, if not them, then the question becomes that we might assume, if not Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the forefathers, then we would think that maybe our, the sons of the forefathers, the sons of Yaakov, the fathers of the twelve tribes, that we should name our, we should bless our children in their name. But again, that's not the case. The blessing that we give our sons is the blessing that Yaakov, our father, grandfather, gave to his grandsons on his deathbed, Ephraim and Menashe. In the portion of Ayachi 4820, it states, By you shall Israel bless, saying, May God bless you like Ephraim and Menashe. Yesim chalokim kephraim and Menashe. This seems very strange. Why bless our sons with this blessing? It would seem more appropriate to bless them with either our forefathers or one of the sons of Yaakov, one of the 12 tribes. Why would, we take, why would this blessing take precedence over any other? Now, in order to truly understand the blessing, we really need to go back to, to the story in the Torah of Yosef and his brothers who sold him. The simple reading of the text in the Torah tells us that the brothers hated Yosef and they sold him to Egypt as a slave. Now our sages tell us that there are 70 facets to the Torah, much like, much like a diamond. And this is one of the reasons that the Torah was written with no vowels, only consonants. This allowed us the ability to look deeper into the text and learn different ideas from the same exact words. You know, there's a measure that states that the reason that the brothers sold Yosef was really based on a philosophical debate. The commentaries tell us that our forefathers actually kept the whole Torah, and this was even before it was given to the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. However, our sages tell us that they only kept the Torah when they actually were in the land of Israel itself. When they were outside of the land, they did not obligate themselves to observe it. So based on this statement, Yaakov, our father, according to the Torah law, would not have been allowed to marry two sisters at the same time. However, since he was outside the land of Israel, he did not obligate himself to follow this law. And so he allowed himself to marry both Leah and her sister Rachel, two sisters at the same time. Now there's a, another principle that the sages tell us. It said, Misa Avosimilabon. The deeds of the forefathers are assigned for their children which means that the actions that the forefathers took in their lives was somehow connected to the lives of their descendants in the future. For example, Avraham, Abraham, our father, went down to Egypt uh, for the, when there was a plague, which was a precursor for his descendants going down into the exile in Egypt, again, based on a plague. Probably not a plague, a famine, excuse me. So the philosophical debate between Yosef and his brothers was, can a Jew be an observant Jew without the land? Or, like the forefathers, 
is one obligated to serve God as an observant Jew only when they are in the land. So the brothers said that the obligation to be, obser be an observant Jew is connected to the land, much like the forefathers. Yosef said no. That a Jew can be an observant Jew and serve his creator anywhere, with or without the land. And so they said to him, prove it. And he did. He remained the same observant Jew in Egypt that he had been in the land. So whether he was a slave in the house of Potiphar, whether he was in prison serving as a prisoner, or whether he was the viceroy of Egypt, the second most powerful man in the world, he was Yosef. His religiosity never wavered. The name of God, as it says, was always on his lips. But even more than that, he was able to bring up two sons in the most decadent and licentious country in the world. They were more than privileged. Their father was the second most powerful man in the world, and there was nothing that they couldn't do. They had the ability to enjoy every pleasure that wealth and power can afford. In reality, they should have stumbled on their path to God and religiosity. They should have, at best, become what we call bali tshuva, returnees to the path of godliness. They could have tasted from all that the devil has to offer. Then, after experiencing all the vanities of life, then they could have found their way back to that which is the only truth in life, serving and connecting to the one and only God in the world. They had no backup system. They were alone on an island. They only had their father, their mother, and each other. Truth is, they were doomed for failure, and yet somehow they succeeded. So why did Yaakov, their grandfather, on his deathbed, bless, bless his grandsons? So in the portion of Ayaki 48.5, it says that Ephraim and Menashe, he, uh, Yaakov said to Yosef, that Menashe and Ephraim, Ephraim and Menashe will, shall be to me as Reuven and Shimon. Now Reuven was the eldest of the sons of Yaakov. Shimon was the second eldest. So it's interesting that the numerical value of the names Ephraim and Menashe are 732 one more than the numerical value of Reuven and Shimon, 731. Yaakov, in some special way, saw them as his children, not his grandsons. Now, immediately before his death, his father's death, Yaakov, Yosef brought his two sons to his father for their last blessing. Yosef puts Menashe, the eldest, of his father's, uh, the eldest on his father's right hand, and Ephraim the youngest on his father's left hand. Now Yaakov lifted his hands, but instead of extending them over the two boys, he crossed them so that his right hand was on Ephraim's head, the youngest one, and his left hand on Manasseh, the elder one. Now this was the first time in history a blessing was given by placing one's hands on the one being blessed. Now, since this would be the beginning of the exile, Yaakov wanted a solid connection between the blessing, blesser and the blessed, based on Hafla. Now, when he did this, Yosef was concerned that his father had switched his hands, crossed them. But his father would not let him remove them with the words in 48.20, By you shall Israel bless, saying, Yisimcha lo kemke Ephraim May God bless you like Ephraim and like Menashe. And he put Ephraim before Menashe. So now we have an additional question. First, why bless our sons with a blessing given to grandsons? And secondly, why would Yaakov put Ephraim before his older brother Menashe? And why did he cross his hands? Now, each of us as parents hope, hope and dream, that our children will one day be able to reach their potential. Wow, that would be great. What about a child that would go one step further, do the impossible, and exceed their potential, whatever their potential was initially? That is more than a dream. It's Herculean. When Yaakov is told that Yosef is alive and the viceroy of Egypt, after 22 years, he couldn't believe it. Life to Yaakov could only be described as someone who follows the path of God and his Torah. 
in reality couldn't believe that Yosef living in Egypt, and in addition to that being the viceroy to the most powerful man in the world, would still be, so to speak, alive. There could be no way that he could still be following the path of Torah and mitzvot. He couldn't be alive. But the brothers assured Yaakov, and in addition, Yosef sent along certain signs that he was still the same Yosef, the observant and God-fearing as when he left 22 years ago. Now Yaakov is on his deathbed, deathbed, and he wants to bless his two grandsons who grew up in Egypt before he dies. But even more than that, he wanted to bless all of his grandsons, all of his grandchildren, until the end of time, with this timeless, with his timeless words of hope and encouragement. A blessing from a tzaddik, a righteous grandfather, a prayer that our son should follow these two sons to be able to not only reach their potential, but even more than that, exceed their potential. You know, the commentaries tell us that one of the reasons that he blessed Ephraim, the younger one before Manasseh, was that Ephraim was the Torah student and Manasseh was involved with his father in affairs of the state. So Yaakov, by crossing his hands and placing his right hand on Ephraim and the left on Manasseh, was telling us that both approaches to life are correct. He didn't move Manasseh. But before we bring a son into the secular world of business and politics, we should first make certain that he receives a good spiritual Torah education. You know, Yosef was concerned that by his father's acts of crossing his hands during his son's blessing, that they would continue what seemed to be the endless trend of the younger sibling taking preference over the older siblings. As I mentioned last week, history seemed to prove this fact to be true. It began with the first two brothers. Hevel, the younger, was chosen over his older brother, Cain. Shame, the youngest son of Noah, over his two older brothers. Yitzchak, over his older brother, Yishmael. Yaakov, over his older brother, Esau. And Yosef, over his other brothers, especially Reuven, the eldest. History testifies and on how these relationships turned out. However, this trend stopped with Ephraim and Manasseh. Nowhere in any of the holy writings or commentaries do we find any hint that there was any dissension or division between these two brothers. Somehow, they managed to continue to live in peace even after they received their blessings. So, so now maybe we can understand why Yaakov, our father, stated that we, his descendants, should bless our sons with, this, with his very special blessing. A blessing that contains spiritual blessings, material blessings, and most of all, harmony, shalom. Peace, especially between siblings. What more could we as parents wish for our sons? And with that, may we use this blessing of peace and harmony to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. God bless and have a great Shabbat, a great week. Again, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay happy.